Mach 3, give me cruise show on 2, 3, and 4. Show on 1, actually. 6, 3. Mach 3, give me start line 2. 5, electric. Mach 3, 5, electric. 5, electric. Mach 3, give me start line 1. And cruise show on 7 and 9. Line 1. Hey, I'll do something. I hate weapons. Super Ops, line 3, Red Ball, Avionics. Super Ops, line 7 is code 3 for light in the gear handle. Okay, so today I'm joined by Lori Norris, who I've known probably for six years, but more incidental to my military transition and kind of preparing for my military transition but i connected with her on linkedin and she's just an absolute treasure trove of great information great insights great connections which we'll talk later about networking and how connections kind of play in um but uh, she started a podcast and she was nice enough to have me have me on a couple months ago and i felt it was only fair for me to reciprocate and introduce her to my audience so Lori, thank you very much for joining me Thanks for having me, Chris. It's a it's a weird sensation to be on the other side of the table, but I'm excited to be here. So I I kind of call myself a bilingual translator. Um, I don't speak a foreign language. I speak the language of the U.S. military. So I never served myself, but I learned and how to translate military skills. So I've been teaching veterans since 2005 as a volunteer, whether it was at the TAP program as a volunteer, and I taught the three-day Department of Labor portion of the TAP program um, for several years, and really have just been continuing to volunteer since then. I've also owned a career services business, Get Results Career Services, since 2004, where I write resumes, cover letters, LinkedIn profiles, and really focus on helping veterans. And then Last year, as you mentioned, I launched a podcast. So I have the Lessons Learned for Vets podcast, which I created to support transitioning veterans and just provide as much education and information as possible. But I know we're going to talk about that later. So yeah, we are. And I love the podcast too, because I, I mean, I, lo I love the medium as it is. But if, if you think about your career, your the reach of what you would do in the mid 2000s up until the podcast, it was very geographically limited and or whatever contacts and third string contacts you could kind of make those touches you could do. But now that you have a podcast, you've essentially created a platform where that information, that message can reach a really wide audience as, as wide as that that uh, audio can be shared. And I think that's really, really powerful amplifying what you're doing. And that's, that's really why I started it, because I really enjoyed teaching veterans. I just couldn't fit teaching tap into my schedule anymore. And so I wanted to find a way to be able to continue educating transitioning service members and provide that knowledge that I know that they get in tap, but it's so <laughs> there's so much delivered in such a short period of time that I wanted to be able to give them little bite sized chunks that they could um, they could utilize better. And what I really love about your podcast, too, is every week you have a guest on that's typically a veteran that's transitioned and or a veteran that's about to transition or somebody that's an expert in that veteran sort of hiring or employment community. And much like many parts of military service, whenever you're about to deploy, you always ask people who have been there before. When you're about to go to Korea, you do the same thing. What units are good? What place should I go? It's yeah. this like storytelling that's just human nature and what you're doing is you're gathering this group of veterans that have experienced the transition process because the reality is a veteran does not know how to train you only transition one time and right. it's to try to gather all this information is really important because it's a huge move especially when you're talking about people who have been doing it for 20 years or more or something like that this is big unknown so when you gather together people of these diverse career fields going into diverse industries all with their own unique experiences, what you kind of do is you can pull together these threads, like what worked and what didn't work, what is homogenizing across all these experiences. And what you get is a very efficient and succinct sort of narrative for what can your transition look like and what lessons or what, what did these people wish they had known and what did they do really well? And you're talking about really what you're talking about is decades of experience in transitioning for all these people 
And you're condensing it down into bite-sized 30 minute things that a veteran that's a year out or two years out from transitioning can listen to and just get this great insight that normally wouldn't be available to them. In a perfect world, I would be in the ear of every active duty service member two to five years before they even think about transitioning. And so that they can start learning about the obstacles that are coming their way and the challenges they might face and, you know, the strategies that work best. And I know everyone is different. You know, one of my guests, Herb Thompson, his, 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 he always says, own your transition, right? And I know that everyone's going to have different challenges, different issues that they're going to face. But my goal is just to give them some knowledge and arm them with some tools so that they can overcome those when they get there, right? It's like, a map, right? I know there's like a bumpy road ahead, yeah. but I know I I can prepare for it. And that's really what my goal is. So before we get into the topics we kind of laid out for ourselves here, I want to ask one more thing because you're not a veteran, right? I'm not. So how hard was it for you at the beginning of this journey that you're on for you to, you know, you're say you're like a a translator for military jargon and skills and and all these things to the civilian sector. How hard was it for you to learn that culture and that sort of uh, that that vernacular. So obviously, I mean, have you ever learned a foreign language yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, we start out stumbling, right? But what I did was I asked a lot of questions, and someone would throw a term out there that I didn't understand. I'm like, "What's a hanger queen?" Yeah, that's <laughs> so. That sounds like part of "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." Let's talk about this hanger queen. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, and I would just ask those questions. And, and so then I have a very strategic marketing background. And so I would look at what they talked about and say, okay, you have, you know, you've managed, um, you know, the pulling parts from the hanger queen. Think of that as your, um, part storage. Yeah. Right. And so how are you coordinating the logistics of managing the supply chain so that that aircraft doesn't stay down all the yeah. time, that you can rotate those parts and meet the needs of the, of the unit while still maintaining that aircraft so that it can be returned to service. So it, it's one of those things where I just have to take a strategic marketing approach to what you've done and what you want to do. And it was just me asking a lot of questions. I I've still don't know everything. There are once sometimes people come in with a, you know, a, a job title that I don't know, but, you know, bring me a pro super or an expediter or a flight chief any day. And, you know, a low observables uh, craftsman. I could, I feel like I could probably like, you know, shoot wire because I know I've written about it so many times, you know, so, so I think that's, and you kind of touched on something that's really important that I think a lot of service members don't quite understand when they're transitioning that you're describing canning parts from a hanger queen. That does not feel as somebody that's been that had done it for a long time and probably a lot of my listeners, that doesn't feel like a skill that you would even talk about in in an interview. And I think part of what you do is being able to recognize that while there's a lot of mundane things that we do in the military, there's a lot of things that we do that's a good process or is immediately translatable to a very like process in the civilian sector that we wouldn't even even consider. Like I talked to Mark Adams recently about, you know, AFSO 21, Lean Six Sigma, all that stuff. And I didn't realize how great that stuff was until I went out into the civilian sector and started seeing organizations that didn't have it. I'm like, oh, I get it yeah. now. And I didn't appreciate it. And it seemed like it wasn't important, much like the hanger queen, much like flowing phase, much like scheduling leave and dealing with discipline, which seems so innate to a lot of service members. Mm-hmm. That's a real skill in the civilian sector. And what you kind of talk about is I can find all the good things or all the, your experiences that you may not even know has value for your transition and I can showcase it. And I think that's just a huge, that's a huge boost for anybody transitioning, both in what they're doing and the confidence and trust that they're gonna be able to get through it, which is a big piece as well. So, and I think you're right. It's just looking at things different, right? So like canning parts from a hanger queen is supply chain management, right? Um, Managing the phase flow is planning projects. You know, an AFSO 21 Tiger team is a Lean Six Sigma process improvement project team. 
you know, it's just different words. So, um, and I just, I had to learn it, but I learned it because I wanted to help. Yeah. And now you've got to learn the opposite direction because if you want to succeed in translating your terminology and landing a role in this, in the private sector, you've got to do it. Yeah. So it's just different motivations, but you still can do it. Yeah. You know, I did it. So you've been in this in this world for quite a while, right? Early two mm thousands. -hmm. How much has it changed in the last twenty years that you've seen? Because you know, when I joined the Air Force in nineteen ninety eight, my resume and my interviewing and stuff prior to that was radically different than when I retired in two thousand eighteen. So yeah. I'm wondering, what have you seen in that shift? What what doesn't happen anymore? What's less important? What's more important? And, and how has it morphed in that time you've been doing it? Well, I'll tell you, I have a special place in my heart for retirees for a couple of reasons, right? Because number one, you've served 20 plus years of your life to our country, but also because we're of an age, I'm, I'm likely <laughs> older than most of those right. retirees. But do you remember when we would go to look for a job and we would circle ads yep. in the want ads in the newspaper, right? Now everybody's like, what's a newspaper? So, I mean, it, for some people, the last time they looked for a job, they did go to the newspaper to find that job. Or they walked in the door and said, hey, are you hiring? And try that today. Like I have a USAA uh, major corporate headquarters here. It's like try to get through the USAA yeah. gate to go say, hi, are you hiring? And you know, you're not going to make it. So that process has changed. And how you go about finding open jobs. You know, they say that 80% of uh, jobs go unposted. So it's the hidden job market that no one's even putting it out there. So how do you learn about it? So that part is really different in that, you know, people aren't really posting their jobs anymore yeah. as much as they used to. Um, now we have to navigate through a computer, right? So you've probably heard of the ATS, which is, stands for Applicant Tracking Software. And so you've got to make sure that your resume is able to make it through that. It's, think of it as a funnel, right? Mm -hmm. So your resume goes in, you know, they get hundreds of resumes, they put keywords into a system and they say, this is what we're looking for. And the computer scans it, usually before a human does, not always, but most companies use some form of applicant tracking system. And then they parse out information from your resume into their system. So we want to make sure that um, you know, we've got our resume formatted in a way that works with the applicant's tracking system, but I don't want you to stress out over the ATS. It's like, oh, a robot's making a hiring decision. No, humans are still making that hiring decision, but we just have to make sure we're making it through the robot first, right? So I have a real love-hate relationship with that because part of me is like, it's frustrating to get my resume almost, almost trying to morph my resume into a specific keyword or hit certain things. It forces me to highlight things that I'm maybe less proud of or is less prominent, but that's what I need in order to showcase it. But on the flip side, I think a lot of these jobs have a bunch of applicants. And if they had a human being manually going through all these, I may not even be seen ever because maybe a showy applicant got in and got hired before mine even got looked at because the human being was just exhausted from looking at these applications. So like, I love it because it gives me a fair chance when it's going towards a hiring manager and it filters out some of the chaff, we'll say, but I hate it because I hate trying to shoehorn my life experience into a very sterile and compartmentalized sort of uh, application system. And that, I get that, you know, and, and, but think about how much longer the hiring process would take, right? right? Now you can skim through, you know, 200 applicants in a matter of minutes versus how long would it take a human to actually read through, you know, 200 resumes? So yeah. and we give you some quick ATS rules some that you can always get through. Okay. So first and foremost, um, don't put anything on your resume in a text box or a table. Okay. Okay. ATSs cannot read that information. Do not put your contact information in a header. So if you go insert header and you put your name and phone number in there, ATSs can't read headers. And so you go into their system with no name, no phone number, no anything. Okay. And then I want you to focus on keywords. And the best way to do that is to only 
from the very beginning, write targeted resumes. I know mm-hmm. in TAP, they teach you to write a master resume. That resume should never see the light of day. <laughs> Put it away. It's like a repository of right. information. Think of it as a housing place, but you always want to create a resume that's targeted for an industry. So if you know, okay, I want to go into logistics and that's great. That's an industry. You say, I want to be in a, a leader in logistics. And so that's the kind of resume you create that's filled with those keywords. And that way you have a nice solid foundation to build on. And then as you find a job, then you target it. So it's yeah. not a, let me rewrite this whole master resume. I'm starting from a solid foundation where it's filled with keywords. Now I'm just going to research the company and, and customize each resume to that. So it's about quality over quantity. You should not be sending out 50 resumes a week. Yeah, where do you where Absolutely. do you get those keywords from for for that resume? So a couple of places. First and foremost, I mean their job their job posting is a keyword cheat sheet for you, yeah. right? If it were that easy, we would all make it through. So I also recommend you do just some industry research. So Onet is a great place. Yeah, Onet, you can actually. I know we use the crosswalk feature on Onet a lot of times to translate, but. You can actually go out and look up on Onet, what does a logistics manager do? And it's filled with keywords. So just looking at job postings and then also informational interviews and networking, talking to your network. Those are some ways that you can do it, right? So I think informational interviews are huge because it not only gets you an idea of what you need to showcase for your application, it also gives you a good idea of what the industry is really like. And I think for a transitioning veteran, Getting that informational interview and and finding out what is the work-life balance, how much travel is there, what certifications do you have, are you capped on your progression, do you need a master's degree, like those informational interviews I think are really huge, which goes back to your podcast. I think you're also doing essentially informational interviews with a whole bunch of people and presenting it to your audience as well. So I think that's a big deal. Yeah, I do try to to get some information in there about different industries. And, you know, I've had a couple of people that have left jobs yeah. after, uh, you know, six months, three months, and they talk about why yeah. and, you know, what, how hard that was to like, quit something. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that I try to do, you know, like another, another new thing that's kind of on the scene that probably you didn't have this obviously back when you know before you um, joined the military is LinkedIn right so LinkedIn has become such an important part of the job search today and I know everyone's like I don't want to do social media LinkedIn's not social media in that traditional Facebook Twitter sense of the word it's a it's a place for you to house a professional profile and the great thing about LinkedIn is it's a if you optimize your LinkedIn profile, just like you do your resume, it can do the job hunting for you. And people will search you out and, yeah. and find you. Um, but it's a tool that only works if you put it to use, right? So like my pen is a tool, but if I don't use it to write with, it's not going to do anything. It just sits on my de- on my desk, right? So think of LinkedIn the same way. So, but I will tell you that 95% of Fortune 500 companies use LinkedIn for recruiting. Yeah, I believe it. And 98% of recruiters use LinkedIn to source and recruit talent. Hmm. So it's the numbers don't lie. And so it's really important. Yeah, I've been bragging on LinkedIn uh, for a while. I, my One of my frequent guests, Kevin Traw, he does a lot of veteran hiring for, for his company. We kind of go back and forth about his experience with it and stuff. And uh, probably the best thing I did was uh, a few episodes ago, I said, hey, if you want a connection on LinkedIn, let me know. And that way you, I can get you started. But secretly, it grew my connections. So uh, yeah. it's it's a symbiotic also environment, right? Like the connections you form, you're helping those people, but also you can you know get some help uh, for yourself as well. So it's really important to make those connections. And, and like I said on the podcast with you, engage meaningfully. It's not just likes. I mean, I've gotten a connection request for somebody that had like a thousand people and I went to see his activity and he has no activity for the last two years. I'm like, okay, so that's not a useful person right. for me to, to engage with. Uh, but LinkedIn is a professional environment. It should behave appropriately. Um, 
but it's it's powerful, especially especially after COVID. You're talking about how much of our world turned virtual, which means typical networking events had to be virtual. LinkedIn probably did a lot of heavy lifting for people finding jobs, especially when jobs came open again. I, I can't really say enough for the value of LinkedIn. Obviously, it's not perfect, but man, it makes a huge difference. And um, I know uh, service members get a, a, a year free of LinkedIn premium. Um, that's a huge benefit. But mm -hmm. really, it's and I say this a lot and I run to people that are like, I'm retiring next week and then they start LinkedIn. You need to start your LinkedIn <laughs> profile as many years as possible out from when your separation is. And if it's just growing your connections and then and then engaging in content, like that's a good thing. Like, yeah. absolutely, it's a good thing. And I, I, in a perfect world, I would go and teach people in ALS yeah. how to create a, a LinkedIn profile. Even though they want to stay in for 25 years, they still should have one and start building that network because then when you need it, yep. let's just say you get hurt and you have to get medically separated. Yeah. And now you're like, well, I wasn't planning to get out at 12 years. Now what? Right. So it's there when you, your your network's there when you can, need to call on it. So I did a, a um, podcast with somebody the other day. She got really laid off. We'll call it laid off. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, terminated right mm -hmm. from her job. She didn't have a job anymore. And within five hours, she had a new position. Yeah. So it was a, my a episode with Marina Robinick. Yeah. And so um, it was, you know, and it's all about her network. Yep. She reached out to her network and they went to battle for her. Yeah. That's and a big deal. Five hours. And yeah. that's, and so. that's, you're talking about how do you quantify that value? It's really hard to understand the value of LinkedIn, which is makes it exceedingly, exceedingly difficult because also how you engage on LinkedIn, like you can debate and you can discuss but when it shifts from that to something a little bit more sort of visceral or a little bit more uh, venomous, then you're you're literally poisoning your professional environment. Like it's really yeah. important not to do that. It, it, you need to. I think part of it is our minds have a hard time differentiating between Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn because it's very similar in its appearance. But you know, you should LinkedIn should be a very specific site with very specific behaviors in it, and you know behave appropriately I would, I would say use it to demonstrate your knowledge and expertise don't use it to complain to say all recruiters suck to say i hate the this transition is terrible use it for positive use yep. it to highlight your knowledge of process improvement so people see that and when they see that they have a process improvement job they're like hey i've been seeing this guy talk about process improvement yep. let me reach out to them right so that's really what LinkedIn is for. And that's how you you engage. Yeah. You don't have to be on there hours and hours every day, but I believe you can do it in 15 to 20 minutes a day and you can make a huge impact on your network and your job search. Yeah, I it? typically get on LinkedIn for about 15, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I try to do every day, if not at least every other day. And it's basically... Um, I, I do the recents. I set my page recent because I don't want the algorithm deciding what I see. I said it's recent and I scroll and I find, and, uh, you know, it's there's a, usually really interesting stuff. And I'll see stuff on LinkedIn before I see it anywhere else and kind of bring that information mm -hmm. out of that sort of ecosystem into a broader eco ecosystem. It's, it's really quite valuable. I agree. Yeah, it's something that if I if I could just always when I talk tap, I'm like, if I could just do one thing today, if I could just convince you to get on LinkedIn yeah. and to use it and to optimize your profile and, you know, have a photo of you not in a uniform, yeah. um, you know, have more than just the bare bones outline. You really put those keywords and and detail your work experience and you got to translate on LinkedIn just like you do on your resume yeah. and then engage with people post something once a week but if you're not comfortable doing that yet just get out there and comment on things and share other people's content or articles and just kind of start you can slowly walk into the pool yeah. but you know definitely get to your get to the point where you feel comfortable posting and you will make a name for yourself yeah and speaking of tap i have a love-hate relationship with tap too like i thoroughly enjoyed it i think i learned a lot i was one of those people that did it twice i did it a year out I think six months out, I did it because I just wanted to re kind of absorb things. I also did the like the veteran small business, uh, like the, the, the side one, because I was looking at that mm -hmm. as well. Like, I love the chance to 
exercise mus mental muscles that you have not touched in my case for 19 years or whatever it was. But what I, what I get frustrated with tap is, is it's so generalized because it can't be tailored to each. I mean, when you're, I mean, I know they really do like a kind of like an, a uh, senior leadership tap and like a regular tap, but the reality is a lot of times there aren't slots for it. And what a young um, senior airman in services and what a senior master sergeant in security forces, like they are going to have a radically different career path, both in what industries, but also what positions and lived experiences and all those things that unfortunately the tap has to create a, a floor that serves everyone in that room of all those diverse experiences and job prospects and futures, which is good because I think a lot of us just don't know. Um, but it's bad because it's not like that really important sort of tailored experience. But um, again, not to sound like uh, I'm beating a dead horse, but that's where um, your services and also your podcast can come into play. Because your podcast is basically the, all these people have been through TAP. What did they? What worked and what didn't work? What worked in their transition? And kind of share those stories. Um, but also it's important to invest in your transition as well. Because I think a, po a lot of people try to do their transition and not spend any money on themselves, either buying the right clothing for the interviews. Because for me, like my wardrobe was severely lacking. I had like funeral clothes, like maybe something nice to wear. Then it was a whole bunch of uniforms and then jeans and t-shirts. And that type of stuff isn't going to fly when you're going into a real job interview that has, you know, professionals that are looking at you and how you're going to integrate into their culture. Yeah, you're right. And so, I think, you know, there are a lot of places out there that will help you with that, right? There's a salute to suit um, that, you know, you can get, I think it's like two suits and four shirts and six ties or something, you know, some crazy package right. like that for a couple hundred dollars and they'll custom make it for you. So definitely look up some of those services that are out there, but you're right. I, I mean, tap is a great resource, but it it's, you know, it is what it is. It's five days. Yeah. And three, only three of those days are dedicated to the job search process. And they yep. just keep kind of whittling it down and down and down. And from what I understand, they're barely even talking about the resume now. They just said, go get the free resume. We'll talk about that later. Um, and, you know, it's, it is a good program. It's got great content, but it's just not enough. Yeah. You know, and, and so the military is not in the business of turning you back into a civilian. Yeah. Just not. And so yeah. they... Um, I think that it definitely they, they need to give it more time. Um, I think, you know, I had a chief once tell me, like, I, I feel like I'm trying to drink from a fire hose yep. sitting here in your class. Right. Because when I would teach tap, I would like open up my brain and just dump it on, on everyone. Like, this is all my knowledge. Have it. And I think it probably was really overwhelming because I do have a lot of knowledge in this subject. But I didn't want any of them to struggle any more than they had to yeah. and that's you know so that you're right that's why i do my podcast because i want to be able to give that knowledge to as many people as possible yep yeah and it's such it's just i mean podcasts in general are convenient you can yeah. download them on your phone and listen on road trips i used to say pod, podcasts for long road trips so i could just binge a whole bunch and it's like white space like I, I don't like doing podcasts when i'm doing work because it's distracting i can't allocate my mental space to it but when i'm driving and i'm on autopilot I don't have to pay attention to much. I, I can just absorb all the information. So it seems like it's a much more uh, important use uh, of the time. So uh, we kind of talked about how there's now automated, you know, uh, systems for applications and LinkedIn, which didn't exist. I mean, you said LinkedIn probably didn't exist in 1998. MySpace didn't exist in 1998. So no, I didn't. it's important <laughs> to quantify how ancient <laughs> some of us are. Um, and then, you know, the tap, which is good and, and bad, but I think it's probably, you know, when you have such a large audience, it's hard to be a tailored sort of product. Yeah. Um, so we kind of talked about networking on LinkedIn, but I imagine networking has been one of the primary um, avenues for job searching and things since time immemorial, right? Yeah. I mean, like I said, we used to be able to walk in, shake someone's hand, look them in the eye and say, are you hiring? And, um, you know, that just doesn't happen as much anymore. Right. I mean, I was at the gym this morning and uh, we had a lady walked in. She's like, hey, I'm a personal trainer. Are you hiring? And my the owner of the gym's like, actually, we are. So it was like, you can still do that once in a while, <laughs> but not very often, especially yeah. not for large companies. Um, but 
So if you can't walk in the door, having a referral from your network is like having the door open for you, right? So we talked about LinkedIn earlier. So use LinkedIn to target your search. So you say, well, I don't have a network. I don't know anybody at the ABC company where I want to work. You can actually go into LinkedIn and do a targeted search of, you can put in filters and say, I want to find someone that works today at the ABC company that once worked at in the Navy, the Army, yep. the Marine Corps, the Air Force. And now you can reach out to them and say, hey, I'm a veteran too. I, I'm interested in working for the ABC company. I'd like to connect with you. And after you connect with them, then you ask them, hey, can I just get 15 minutes of your time to talk about your transition yep. and how you landed at the ABC company and what it's really like to be a logistics leader in the private sector? So, and that's, you start doing that. And that's really kind of how it leads to those, those informational interviews. And then that's how it leads to the referral process. You know, once you're finished with that informational interview, then you say, Hey, would you mind if I send you my resume so you can just take a look and see, have I done a good job? of marketing myself for this yep. type of a role. Now they have your resume in their hands, right? So, so it's again, now do you see that that's a, that's a process. It's yep. going to, it's not something that's all going to happen in 10 minutes. Now we know why we need to start so far back. Right? Yeah. So why we need to prepare ourselves. So, so yeah, networking is absolutely still important. Um, there, you know, another thing that's changed and is that all of these veteran service organizations, right? So there's, there's like 40,000 plus VSOs out there. Right. And that's a lot, right? It's like going into a candy store and you're like, I don't know what to pick. But some of the things that I would say is use the ones that have, um, so Vets to Industry, one mm -hmm. of my favorites, right? Started by Brian Arrington, retired um, Master Sergeant, Security Forces Master Sergeant in the Air Force. Um, and so he, what he's done is created like a repository of resources for you. And the, the, com the um, organization vets them for you. So mm -hmm. they look at, are they legitimate before they even get listed on the site? So I just submitted two to them the other day and now they're going to go out and research those. You know, I know the people personally that I submitted the, the VSOs to, um, to, but they're going to vet them before they'll even list them. So, yeah. um, Veterati is another one where you can get on an hour long call with mentors in all different industries. Um, ACP, American Corporate Partners, that one actually matches you with a mentor that you have for a year. Yeah. And um, they can kind of follow you around the key mentor group. Um, so both Vets to Industry and the key group do networking, virtual networking events where you can go in um, and do it like a Zoom breakout room yeah. and speak directly to a recruiter. It's great. So it's another way to build that network and have those in internal referrals. Yeah. And also a lot of states have their own um, VSOs that kind of just handle like here in Maine, we have a, a nonprofit called Boots to Roots, which uh, until recently, I, I think she's on the board, but she used to be the executive director. She was an old B1 pilot and speaks the flight line language. And her job was to basically pair up about to be separated service members with a good job industry in Maine and kind of resume and networking and, and basically create a soft landing for when they get here. Uh, and I, uh, you know, Mike McDowell setting up Valor Club USA down in San Antonio and looking to do it everywhere else. So I think, I think there are national organizations that do really great things, but they also don't, don't discount. Like there's local organizations that you can find, but those, that's also where your network's going to come into play. Like if you know where you want to land, start building your network ahead of time. So that way, when you show up there, they already know all the places, all the people you need to talk to so you can kind of get started, which really flows into the next point. Now, networking is really dependent on your reputation, your work ethic, and especially with the military. Like, yeah, you might be able to find just a, a veteran at another place that's looking to hire veterans. Like uh, Kevin Traw is big on that. He, he loves to help veterans, Air Force or not, just, just get a job and, and, and land on their feet and be successful. But part of your network is people you've worked with that can vouch for you, which means your your you know your in service reputation for honesty, work ethic, you know all of those things. It very well can travel outside the military into your network. So uh, you know keep it in mind that it's not just like a rebirth when you separate and you get like this this. It's not like bankruptcy; you get to cleanse yourself. Like it's important that you maintain a high standard, or else your network is going to be. 
um, what you would expect from somebody that doesn't have good work ethic or work good uh, reputation. Like I'm, I wouldn't, there's some people I work with that I wouldn't vouch for if they reached out to me because I'm attaching my name to theirs. Um, right. So something to keep in mind, especially when you're on the verge of getting out and maybe you, you aren't getting out of the military in the best terms, just realize that how you kind of leave the military and how you interact, being professional on your way out the door can really help you in the long term as well. I'll say. Yeah, you are still going to need those references. They're, you know, people are going to call for reference checks and, and absolutely. And, and having those good relationships, like, you know, I would maintain those. And LinkedIn's a great way to do that. So you stay in touch. I haven't had a boss since hmm, 2003, I think. So it's been a while. And But I still am connected to yeah. all the bosses I had before 2003 because you just never know if I'm going to need a referral to someone, right? So that's not true. I had a boss when I was teaching TAP. But, you know, it's been a while anyway. So... Um, but keep those keep those connections current so that they can, um, you know, vouch for you, if you will. So you're right. Also, something that seems to come up quite a bit. I guess I'm I guess I might be the outlier. Like I interview very well, but I guess that makes sense because now I'm hosting a podcast and I'm pretty mm -hmm. comfortable with that. And I go on podcasts and things like that. Um, but like when I go to an interview and this might sound weird, if anybody's listening, you ever watched um, The Office like. If you remember when uh, Robert California did the interview for the job at the office where literally he took over like an authoritative place and was really casual and made everybody feel like he was too good for them and they really wanted him um, like that was my that was my mindset and tap. I mean, it was almost playful, but it's also like when I walk into an interview, I don't know why, but I'm. I'm really confident and really comfortable and really gregarious and really social. And a lot of that interview is a to read your skills and experience, but also to see how you're going to integrate to the team. And I think a lot of, you know, Kevin talked about it on uh, the podcast he did a, a few ago where he was talking about when he initially interviewed and he was there like, well, run us through a process improvement. And he grabbed a whiteboard and he started, you know, OK, let's do a scenario and ran through it. And at the end, they said you were really good, but it seemed like you were shouting. And it's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> we're military. We, we we project when we speak. Plus, we're also flight lines. So we might just shout out of habit. But I think a lot of military people don't understand the social norms in the military are really different from the civilian sector. And the reality is, if you want to transition to the civilian sector, either you're going to go into the military industrial complex where your military social norms are normal. But if you don't want to do that and you want to go into like the commercial, like a co real commercial sector, you got to make a lot of adaptations before you do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like I know that you know, like there there is a cussing on your podcast, right? So yes, uh, I, th that's the thing. Like you can't go in to an interview and and you know, then they say, you know, how can you add value to our team? And it's like you know, you drop F-bombs the yeah. entire time, right? So um, you can't go into the interview and say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, yeah. ma'am, with everything you say, right? I mean, obviously, that's a a um, cultural thing based on if you're in the South, it's a little different. But if you yeah. call everyone sir in California or Arizona, like they're going to think, you know, oh, you're you're too military, right? Yeah. Um, so there are those those ways that you have to change how you interact with people. You know, um, think about the fact that you're already, especially senior NCOs, like you have that bearing of leadership about you. That's what the military yeah. taught you. And so you're going into an interview and you're likely interviewing with the person who is going to be your boss. And if you come in too intimidating, they're like, well, this is my job. Yep. I don't want to hire this person because they might threaten my job. Right. So you've got to really think about who you're talking to and kind of matching the way that they speak. And, and you're, I think, you know, you've got to change some of those things. Absolutely. You yeah. know, and, and so the, but think about the fact that the interview is just a conversation. Yep. It really is. So don't put too much stress on yourself to do well in that, in that interview, because you're absolutely right. Like your resume showcases that you are qualified for the job. Like, if you weren't qualified, they wouldn't call you for an interview. They yep. don't just interview everybody. They don't have time for that. So getting the interview, they've said, hey, we believe you're qualified. So walk in the door already with the confidence that I'm qualified to do this job. Now, once you're in there, your job is to showcase that you're a good addition to the team. So interviews are more about 
emotion and how they feel like you fit and they think they can work with you and they do they think you'll be a good addition to the culture. Yep. And so you've got to learn about that culture ahead of time and really do some kind of reconnaissance on the ground of like, what is it like inside so that I can make sure that number one, it's the right place for me. And number two, I represent myself as someone who can fit in. And so. then I would also say like, recognize that unless the company has a large sort of veteran um, community inside of like prior service members, I think, I think a lot of transitioning service members and veterans in general don't understand just how much non-veterans and or civilians don't know about military experience structure. And there might be some biases you have to overcome where you're all strict and disciplinarians. You can't be a team player. You can't be like on equal footing. You don't have to be the alpha. There's a lot of stereotypes that go into a veteran, which is perpetuated by some veterans in fairness. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also when you have a company that doesn't have a huge veteran population, unfortunately, they're using Hollywood, the news, and their cousin's uncle who served <laughs> as their frame of reference for what a veteran is like, yeah. which also is a note to any veterans, like just realize you're an ambassador for others. So how you behave and how you act can ultimately make it easier for our veteran brother and sisters to kind of get hired. Um, but also going into the social norms and culture, I talked about it in episode, uh, I think, 47, where I talked about the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Like, I was insulated from transgender people, essentially, in the military for all but the, like the last year. And the reality is when you go out to the civilian sector, it's much different. And you are going to run into a lot of LGBTQ people in, in, the, in the organization, out in the society, customers, whatever. And... You know, I'm I'm a very accepting person, but I recognize that my social skills in that scenario are atrophied because, like, I stumble over over pronouns. It feels a little bit awkward because I'm just not used to it. And, you know, that might be misconstrued as I have harbor resentments or bigotry or something. And it might it very well could be misconstrued. And I think it's important to expose yourself to that environment and also maybe recognize that. You know, the first interview may, may not get the job, but it's good to get one under your belt because that's the experience you can exhale. And mm -hmm. then as you interview, you're going to hone those skills, too. I mean, it sucks not getting the job you want, but understanding body language and nuance, I think it really plays into it. So um, I think the, the social norms between the military and civilian sector have a bigger impact than a lot of people realize. And only through the process are you going to get comfortable with it. Just a, like a little thing that you want to remember in an interview is smile. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, if you go in and you take it as serious as you have to on a military board, as an example, mm -hmm. and you sit there ramrod straight, you know, at attention and you don't smile, they're going to think you're not going to fit into their culture. So go in and be your person, be yourself yeah. outside of the military board and smile they show them that you are a friendly person just by smiling and and enjoying your your time in that interview. Yeah. I mean, and I know that's hard to do because you might feel like I need this job so I can retire. I've already retired. My family's going to starve. But also remember, most people that are non-military are all in the same situation. Like it's it, it's that lack of security. You just got to kind of have to get used to it. And also have faith in your accomplishments, your competence, your intelligence, your adaptability. The reality is military members in the professional environment are way more resilient, way more adaptable, um, competent, fast learners because we have to, right? Like that's the nature of the military. Um, so have faith in that and yeah, have a good time. I know it sounds bizarre, but like I, when I was in interviews, it was joking and, and laughing and smiling. And ironically, the person that hired me hired me because I said, yes, sir, and stood up when I shook his hand because he was from the South. <laughs> yeah. So that was a very, very specific event. I'm not saying that that's the best way. I'm saying I got really lucky that he noticed that in particular and appreciated it. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's the norm. And I'll, maybe we could still call them sir and ma'am. But just ease off a little bit. You don't have to end every sentence with it. And most of the time <laughs> right. they'll tell you, oh, you can just call me, you know, Brett or whatever. I'm like, right. okay, mm -hmm. appreciate it, Brett. And the, a lot of times they're doing that to make you comfortable because they want to see your personality and they want to set you at ease. Um, so 
I guess you see it a lot because you, you've been doing this for what, 16, 17 years now. Mm -hmm. Is the pre-separation anxiety, is that a universal truth with every service member? We're all freaked out over separation. Well, I think that it, you know, I can't say it's everybody has it, right? But I think that it depends on a couple of things, right? So first of all, I think it depends on how tightly you hold on to your military persona. Oh, interesting. Right? So I highly recommend Herb Thompson's book because he talks about that. that. Like, um, you're at, at God willing, at some point, your military service is going to come to an end and you're going to get to do something else, right? So it, you all, we all have to leave service at some point in time. And so you have to be willing to let go of your identity as an airman, as a sailor, as a Marine, right? So as a soldier, as a coastie, right? So you've got to be willing to let that go and figure out who you are apart from the military. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the people that hold on to that so tight are the ones that have a, a, a lot more anxiety and struggle. That's interesting. Because you're, you're entering a new world and you, when we go, let's say we visit a foreign country, right? So if we refuse to adapt to that yeah. country's social norms and we refuse to learn their language, it's going to be really hard for us to live in that country. Yeah. And we're going to face obstacles. And this is no different, right? It, it is a foreign you know, process, a yeah. foreign culture that you're used to. So you've got to learn to adapt. I don't know a more adaptable group of people than a veteran, right? So, I mean, you've been dropped into positions where you knew nothing about the job, the tasks, the the unit, the you know, the location and you figured it out. Yeah. Like, why is this so different? Right. Yeah, so, in those cases, failure was potentially catastrophic as well. So the pressures were all amped up like crazy. Isn't it now? Like, couldn't it be catastrophic oh, yeah. if you don't adapt yeah. into the private sector though? Yeah. Cause your family starts. That feels like a big deal. That's kind of a big deal, right? I mean, <laughs> obviously not, not for everyone. We're not going to star. We have, right. you know, things like that. But I think, you know, we have to realize that this is a big deal too. And so you've got to make that change and you've got to be willing to adapt and um, embrace that culture. And so I, I feel like some of the people that I know that are the most successful have said, uh, that's over. That part of my life is over. I will always be an airman and I will always be a veteran. I'm proud of my service, but now I'm this, Yeah. you know, and that, I think those are the people that do the the best. Yeah. So that I could give that advice. I would say you've got to figure out how to kind of leave that behind. So. And you talked and you talked about um, like when people get short notice MEB and they have to all of a sudden amp, you know, amp up everything plus their network and all those things, which is why. So I guess how much of that pre separation anxiety is because they may not have done the prep work before. Yeah. You know, yeah, I get like I, MEB short notice, you, you, you may not have time for it. Maybe that's why you should try to at least maintain a baseline, LinkedIn connections and stuff like that. But when it's someone like me that did 20 years that knew on this date, I'm walking out of the military, it's hard for me to have an excuse why I wasn't prepared, except for the fact that maybe I just didn't know all the things I should have been doing. Um, but I wonder how much of that separation anxiety comes from people that did not prepare and put forth what they needed to do in, in preparation for it. I think you're right. I think, you know, if you don't plan and prepare, you will struggle, right? Yeah. So if you go back to one of my earlier episodes, I feel like it's maybe six or seven with Greg Austin mm -hmm. and Greg Austin has been planning for his position for, I think like 14 years. So really he was one of those like ALS and now I'm planning for my yeah. retirement and, but he served, and had a really successful Air Force career. Um, but he really talks you through that plan, that long term planning process. And, yeah. you know, that's kind of who he is. And um, so I, not everyone is a long term planner like he is. But if you, if you try to do this by the seat of your pants, yep. you, you know, you, you, you half ass it, you're going to get half ass results, right? Yep. So 
I think you've, you've got to prepare and you can't just say, well, I went step. I, I know everything I need to know. Right. So that's yep. not enough. You know, I, I wrote a resume, you know, I got my free resume. Okay. Let's start. You know, that's not enough. You've got to take ownership and you've got to do this to the best of your ability because it yep. really, there is a lot right in it. So. And, I'll, and I'll say on top of that, too, I mean, I certainly experienced this when I was um, getting near the end of my career. Your your chain of command likely is not going to reduce your workload in anticipation for you separating. And I'll say to anybody that might still be serving that's into that position, you need to. You it, When you burden your people that are about to separate with the same workload that they maintain for the last 19 years or whatever the amount of time is, you're making them pick and choose and what, mm -hmm. and what, what we're, what we all do invariably is we put our wants and needs second to the military. And that's a lot of times people, I, I imagine people don't want to show up to their separation unprepared. I think a lot of times they were doing a bunch of projects for the last year, trying to get turnover. The turnover wasn't clean. And then there was still the expectation performing at a certain level, whether it was explicit or just the fact that we've been doing it for so long that we have this internal standard. That's where the boss needs to come along and be like, Hey, you're separating in a year. Figure out what you need to take off your plate now. I will find someone for it or I will take it. And we were going to do a reduced workload. You shouldn't have to worry about appointments or anything like that. And I think a lot of times that conversation doesn't happen or it's almost the inverse of, hey, I noticed you're taking a lot of appointments. It's like, yeah, I'm trying to leave the military and I have no idea how to do it. And no one else knows how to do it. And by the way, you don't know how to do it. So I'm trying to like learn. Um, so it's like, it's important for you to sometimes, and it's, I know it's easier said than done, stand up for yourself in your transition and go, I can't do whatever it is. You know, I can't do the air show pro Joe. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't take this on. This is going to end after I'm already separated. You should have someone else. I can maybe be an alternate to kind of mentor them. There really needs to be a legitimate transition from a primary operator to a strictly mentor turnover role for a lot of people in leaving the military. And that's a good way to set up the transition, which by the way, if you're a boss and you take care of someone and help them transition, they're going to be part of your network when you want to transition. They might remember that you're an empathetic leader and they'll mention that when you're going to look for a job. Like that's part of the reputation and hard work. You know, we talk about the network. Take care of your people. Don't try to extract every single ounce of productivity out of them because you're going to set them up for failure and they're not going to want to recommend you. Uh, anyway, let me get off that soapbox. Well, I will say like nothing pisses me off more than when I hear a commander say, no, you, you skill bridge, I need you here. Yeah. Or no, you can't take time off to go to that workshop. We need you to do this. I mean, that it's just selfish, yeah. right? It's short sighted. The military, yeah. yeah, it is. The military will carry on without you. Mm -hmm. It, you know, when the Tuesday on Wednesday, everything's going to be fine. They're going to put another person in place. It, it, things may not run as when you were there, will continue. And it has for many, many years. Yep. And so you've got to put yourself first. And this is, you know, I know we have a question that's similar to this that yep. we'll talk about later, but um, you've got to take the time. But absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about uh, your podcast. When did you start it? And what, I guess, what made you want to do it? And just walk me through like the evolution of how you decided to do it and how you set it all up and I guess how it's going. So I launched it on Veterans Day of 2020. And that was, we started with five episodes. And so I'm now, I think I just released episode 44 uh, two days ago. So why did it start? So I wanted an, a forum where I could educate and inform veterans but I wanted it to be a place where others could come and share their knowledge. And yeah. so I would talk to veterans who had transitioned five, seven years, you know, prior. Um, and, you know, I stay in touch with a lot of people that I've helped, whether it be they came through my tap class or they were customers and they would tell me stories of how they struggled yeah. or um, what they learned from having to leave positions and, you know, how they, um, how they achieve six. And I was like, you, you have to share that story with your fellow veterans. Like they, people can learn so much from what you're telling me. Um, and I didn't have a forum to do that. Yeah. And so I decided to give them that forum. And I don't think anybody wants to listen to me talk 
for an hour. Um, I don't really have a podcast voice in case you didn't notice. Um, that's always been one of my things. I'm like, oh, I don't really have a podcast voice, but that it is what it is, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I just kind of facilitate the conversation. And I um, asked some questions about their process and what they learned. And, you know, I've had ex- just some amazing conversations with people that shared so many like nuggets of wisdom. And I'm just there to add a little extra as well. And then so those, that's most of our episodes are like that, where I interview a friend, whether it was like Bill Kiefer that transitioned like, 20 years ago, I think it yeah. was. Or Peter Klein that, you know, served four years and then launched a nonprofit. Or, you know, like uh, Chris Dreisbach, my, um, he transitioned and was on the show within three months because yep. he hated his first job, you know. So just, you know, I've, I've talked to people at all stages, whether they're officers or enlisted, um, all branches. I've yet to have a coasty on. I need to work on. Um, but I, you know, all branches of the military, men, women, doesn't matter to me. The the criteria. I've, I have people all the time that reach out like, I'd like to be on your show, and I'm like, wait, you're not a veteran, and you're not veteran affiliated. So yeah, you have to be a veteran, a military spouse, or affiliated with a with the military community in order to come on my, my show. Um, and I don't advertise right now. I've had people say, Hey, this, I would really, I would sit through ads to, yeah. to listen to your content. I'm not doing it right now because I want it to feel like it supports the show. So yep. if you're a veteran and affiliated company and you want to come on my show and be a sponsor, great. But I'm not going to be like, Hey, here's a toothpaste commercial. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I'm probably, who knows, you know, it's, it's not the, an, an inexpensive venture, as you know. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at right now with it. Um, I love it. <laughs> it's a, something I really enjoy and it's the messages that I get from people. It's the reviews that I read on, you know, about the podcast that like, where it's making a difference. And yep. that's all I want to do is just help. So. Yeah, I get that. It's, it's funny. It's almost semi divine. Like I'll start to get either burned out or frustrated with my project And then I'll get like an email from a stranger or a message from a stranger going, hey, my senior listened to your podcast and he came into our production office and said, we need to make sure we're not doing these terrible things he's saying. And he's giving (laughs) great advice for how to run a unit. So let's make sure we're doing that. And it's like, oh, okay. well, when I get messages like that, it's like, well, so let's fire the microphone back up and get an episode recorded, I guess. Uh, But yeah, it makes a big difference. And when I reached out to you, I was like, I I feel like I could do this, but I was like, I had the, I certainly had the veteran piece, but I was like, I don't know if I have any expertise on transitioning, but the reality is it's what was your transition like and what did you do well and what did you struggle with? Because people are going to be able to digest how that relates to their experience or to help prepare them. And I think that's the, the much bigger piece. As long as you're really honest and genuine with discussing your experience, I think it's going to be hyper valuable, especially when you can be yeah, reflective on it as well. I've had people talk about, you know, they got fired, they got laid off, they, you know, quit their job after just three months, they, you know, fell on their face. And I think it, it's like cathartic in that you're telling that story, but you also know that you're telling that story and it's helping other people to navigate their own process. Um, and so I always look for unique stories. And I think your, your episode is great because, I mean, you... <laughs> You made a very large pivot. That's true. From aviation maintenance to going to law school. And um, it's something you'd always wanted to do. And you you did it. Like, there's so many people that are like, I'd really like to do this someday. And they don't. Right. So I've had this idea of this podcast and some other projects that I want to do. I've had it for a long time. And it took me years to do it. To, yeah. to You know, so um, sometimes you just have to. As they say, leap and the net will appear, right? Yeah, so. I mean, so I don't think I've, I don't think I've said it on the podcast before, but uh, my podcast started as it was the beginning of the pandemic, like uh, two months in, and obviously social interactions were severely hampered. And I, I texted a few friends of mine, like, "Hey, do you just want to have like a panel discussion about quality assurance or production, and we can just talk about all the things we couldn't say out loud when we were in service yeah. because of those restrictions?" And we did. I recorded like three or four episodes and uh, 
my uh, girlfriend, she's like, I don't have Facebook. It's really hard to watch these episodes. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just throw up on a podcast um, platform so you can just download the podcast. So literally it became a podcast to make it easier for my girlfriend to listen to my ramblings <laughs> about the military. So... That's a good girlfriend that she'll listen to your ramblings. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, it's definitely a, a a mark in the good column for. Her. I just like to go public that my husband has never listened to one episode of my show. He's like, "Well, I'm not a veteran." I'm like, "Yeah, but I'm your wife." And nope, still not. Not yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> that's. Uh, uh, I think you know. Anytime she's on something, um, I'm always kind of want to listen because. Uh, well, also, I think her job's way more interesting than mine, but uh, that's a topic for another day. Uh, but so in preparation for this episode, I posted a, a call for questions. and I think you posted a call for questions on, on LinkedIn as well. Yeah. Um, since this is your episode, let's start with your questions and then we'll go until we either run out of questions or you run out of time. <laughs> So my question, a couple of my questions overlapped with yours. So I'm just going to ask one. Okay? okay. So I had a question um, just the other day with someone and said, of all the things that are needed to be completed during your transition to, you know, work, being in the civilian workforce, what do I feel is the most important? So what one thing is most important to get ready to transition and why? I don't think I could answer this question because it feels like there's so many important things, but go ahead. I'm interested in what you have to say. <laughs> okay. And people hear this word from me a lot and so much so that they think it's probably tattooed on my forehead. Um, Chris can tell you it is not tattooed is not. on my forehead, but it might be someday. And the, the one thing you have to do that is most important that you have to start with is focus. You have to find your focus. If you don't know what you're going to do after the military, everything else about your transition is going to be difficult. Yep. So you have to know what you want to do next, right? And no one's ever really said to you like, hey, what do you want to do next? Do you, do you want to become a flight chief or do you want to go be a MTI, right? So no one's asked you that in the military. So it's a really hard question to answer. And this is one of the reasons I want you to start so far out, especially those of you that are retiring, because there are so many possibilities. And how do you make that decision without doing a lot of research and talking to people and asking questions? But I need you to think about like, what do you want your job to look like next? Do you want to work inside or outside? Yeah. Done working on the flight line, right? Do you want to work in an office, right? Or do you does like the thought of sitting at a desk make you feel like you want to die inside, right? Do you want to <laughs> work with people? Do you want to work with machines? Some people say to me, I never want to lead again. And I will tell you, leadership in the private sector is very different than yeah. leadership in the military. But ask some questions of veterans who are leading today and ask them what's different between when you were leading in the military and when you lead today. Right. So don't just say I don't want to do it until you do some research. Yeah. So um, do you want to um, be in charge and be a leader? Or do you want to be an individual contributor? Do you want to work for a, a large company or a small company, right? So all of these things you have to think about and answer the, and everything follows from that. So if I, and I don't need you to say, I want this job at this company. However, I want you to say, I want to do logistics management in a non-aviation related organization. Yeah. So then now, you know, okay, I've got to take the aircraft out of my, my resume, which we'll talk a little bit about later. I've got to um, focus on my logistics skills. I've got to stream in my, my timeline of my experience to showcase how much logistics experience I have. That drives your resume. That drives your LinkedIn content. That drives who you connect with on LinkedIn. That drives the interview preparation that you do. And so having that, that focus, like figuring out what you want to do next has to be your first step yep. or everything else will be harder. How do you write a resume if you have no idea what you want to focus on. And I think right? even beyond so, that, if you're not passionate about what you want to do, then you're not going to be ultimately happy unless it's you're passionate about money and you're just ch chasing dollar signs, which I think is probably a much smaller percentage of the population than a lot of people realize. I would much yeah. rather be paid less, but do a job that's really rewarding and fulfilling than, than the opposite. Uh, and that's where the focus really needs to come in of what is going to make me proud of my post-military career? Because we have a lot, we all have a lot of pride in our service, 
But now mm-hmm. it's your chance to pick the thing that's going to define you thereafter. And it goes back to what you were saying. The people that have the most success are the ones that don't cling to their military identity and they move into this new phase of their life and that becomes their new identity as well. And that's probably people that are also focused coincidentally, would be my guess. Yep. Absolutely. And so I want you to also know that like just because you pick a focus, you don't have to stay in that. Right. So the average adult is going to change careers, not jobs, but careers between seven and nine times in their life. So you don't have to stay there. So I don't want you to feel like, well, I have to pick. It's so stressful because it's the rest of my life. No, I just want you to know what you want to do right after the military. And and you can always change. But landing that first position out of the military is going to be so much easier for you if you know what you're targeting. Yep, I agree. Okay. So that's my that's my answer. Focus. That's number one. Yeah. So I think that's that's strong. Uh, Do you have another question? That is my only question. My my other one overlapped with yours. Or actually, I had a few of them that I feel like overlap with yours. So you go ahead and ask yours. Which means it's good. It means probably a lot of people have similar thoughts, questions, and concerns. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question I got, um, what is career progression like in the industry, especially compared to the military, where it's very sort of sterile, boards, promotion testing? Um, and then also in the military, there's like upper out sort of mechanisms where if you're in a, in too long, you hire your tenure or whatever, and you get separated. I think generally, um, a lot of people in the military don't know what career progression looks like in the civilian sector. So what does it look like? So first and foremost, I'll tell you, it's not linear and it's not standardized. You don't start out and go E4, E5, E6. You don't, yep. you don't do that. Right. And like, oh, I spent two years as a. E5 and then, you know, I, I get to be an E6 and it, it, that's not the way it works. There's no recipe or checklist for success. You, after you leave the military, you are going to have to take ownership of the fact that you have to be your own career manager. Very rarely. I mean, you're not going to have a shirt looking out for you yep. saying, oh, we need to make sure that we get you, you know, there's not going to be a career field manager that oversees your training path, right? So. Um, I'm not going to tell you that you won't have a mentor or someone guiding you in the private sector, but no one's going to do it as good as you can do it for yourself. So as I said earlier, you're not stuck in one industry, one position, one company for the rest of your career. Like veterans are loyal by nature, right? But I want you to understand that you're going to have to put yourself and your needs first to be a good career manager for yourself. So you might have to leave that first job to get a promotion. You might get stuck. It happens, right? So um, you might be so good at your job that they're like, no, I want to keep you here because you're doing a really good job. And sometimes there's short-sighted managers out there. And so in order to move forward, you have to change companies. That's the way it is, right? So um, you know, again, but before you make that decision to change companies, I want you to ask yourself, have I done everything I can to stand out from the crowd? Have I done everything I can to excel in my position without stressing myself out? Have I communicated that I want to move forward? Right. So one of the biggest things um, back when I was in the corporate world and I kind of progressed really fast from, you know, I was in the, in the retail world. So I was a store manager and then I went into the corporate office in, uh, and then I was promoted to a manager in the corporate office. And so everyone's like, well, how did you do that so fast? I'm like, yeah. I just told every single person that I met that someday I wanted to be in the corporate office. And I asked for advice from everybody I met. How should I go about doing that? What can I do? to become known. And it became widespread that I wanted to progress in my career. So have you even communicated? Because not everybody wants to move forward. Not everybody has ambition. Yeah. Some people just want to go to work, get their paycheck and go home. Yeah. That's that's not that that's wrong. That's just where they're at in their life. So ask yourself, have you done all those things? Have you told people that you want to move forward? Have you um, taken that initiative? Um, and so just make sure that you're very clear, uh, about what you want. So that's the biggest thing I can tell you. That's what I see too. And I want to add to, and, and mention something else. Um, I, from the outside looking in, which is anecdotal at best, 
I've noticed that certainly when you're getting into the just beyond supervisor, when you're starting to do the director and manager sorts of roles, I think very often they ha- almost have to move to get promoted. I see a lot of moving and then getting a VP, you know, going to director to VP job and stuff like that. And I think that's pretty standard. And from what I gather, a lot of the companies don't get really upset over it. I mean, it kind of stinks that they have to backfill somebody, but I think they all understand that that's the way the game goes. So if you're a veteran and you're trying to stay loyal to your company, just recognize that that is a foreign mindset for a lot of companies and it may not be valuable to them at all. They may not see value in that. Um, it might actually be a detriment where they seem, it seems like you're not ambitious and you're not kind of pushing boundaries and things like that. And then the second thing, you know, the military, we tie a lot of our pay and promotion together into the same homogenous sort of entity. But the reality is your pay and your position can often be a little bit uh, divergent from each other in the civilian sector. And a lot of that begins with that first, whatever your first salary is. I, I mean, I think I'm, trust me, I'm guilty of this just as much as every other transitioning veteran, but you're so happy to get a job. And the number they offer is, at or above the number that you had in your mind. But it's like when you buy a car, you don't buy a car and go, well, I can afford uh, $1,200 a month in a car payment and they want $1,200 a month, so that's just perfect. You're like, no, I wanna get the best price. So when you show up at a job, you need to get the best wage and they expect there to be some discussion, but you also need to realize that whatever wage you start at, that's going to reverberate through your career or through that company and maybe even to the next company because some companies go, can you tell me what you're making at the last place? I don't agree with that personally, but that's yeah. something that does happen. Do. And mm-hmm. so if you are really timid and, you know, I'm not going to blame you if you are, because I think most transitioning veterans probably suffer from it like I do. It's hard to ask or negotiate for salary, but that can have long term effects on your earning potential, both at the company you're at and any companies you might go to, depending on how much carries over. I think that people track veteran unemployment, you know, they oh, veteran unemployment is down, right? Mm-hmm. But not a lot of people talk about veteran underemployment, yep. right? So, oh, I have a job, but you're working, like I, I once met a chief who was making 36000 a year mm-hmm. and I'm not because he wanted to be an educator or whatever, you know, but he was just took a lower level job than he yep. was qualified for. And so you've got to, part of that finding your focus is figuring out like, what's my value in the private sector and knowing your worth by doing the research out there and um, and then asking for it, right? Yeah. So if you take the first offer that they make you, you're likely gonna leave money on the table. Yep. So you've gotta go in knowing what you're worth. Like I just talked to somebody today he is in the process of landing a role right now. And, and he said the offer was lower than he asked for, uh, but he negotiated a bonus, like a signing mm-hmm. bonus yeah, yeah. to kind of meet that gap. Now I, I, that's an alternative, but that signing bonus is taxed at like almost 60%. And it's also so you're not, not going to really get it. It's a one yeah, shot. It's yeah, one yeah. time. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's a really good role and it's a good launching point for yep. his career. So I think, yeah, go for it. Um, but just know that if you don't ask, they're not going to give you that money, right? So yep. if, they, if they make you an offer that really is 10000 below what they're willing to pay you and you say yes, they're like, awesome, that's $10,000 in our pocket that yep. we don't have to pay you. Yep. But Because if, if you don't try, they're not going to give it to you. They're not going to say, oh, wait, 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 let me pay you more, right? Your goal is obviously to get paid as much as you can. Their goal is to pay you. As little as they can land you for. It's true. And you're going to find that people at your same level are getting paid different amounts based on how well they negotiated. Yep. So, okay. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so the next question, what are the biggest challenges for prior maintenance people and what certification degrees are the best for their industry? I'm going to assume this is going into aircraft maintenance, which means there's also two wheelhouses here. There's military industrial complex where AMP is probably not nearly as important, but security clearance, top secret security clearance probably pays out in spades versus the civilian sector where an AMP license, maybe an FCC license is going to be way more important than a security clearance. That's like my shot across the bow. I assume I'm probably close to being right on that. Yeah, I think you are right. So remember that your security clearance has to be reactivated. So, you know, let's say you renewed your top secret a year ago, 
it's still theoretically valid for five more years, but it's got to be like reactivated. So if you let it lapse for too long, it's almost like it's a, a reinvestigation process. Correct. Right. So the person I was just talking about, he's waiting to get his final offer because his security clearance lapsed. Yep. He's been out of the industry for four years or so. And so now he wants to go back into industry. His security clearance has lapsed and they're waiting to see how long it's going to take before they'll even make him an offer. Yep. Um, and so just remember that. Right. So if you want to stay in, you know, defense where you can use that security clearance Keep in mind, if you leave the industry, it, it likely will lapse. This feels and, like where focus comes into the conversation. Like if you yes, know you're going into the defense industry, <laughs> then you know mm -hmm. maintaining your security clearance and getting that job quicker. Even if it's maybe an entry level position that requires a security clearance, it keeps it active and then you can maybe move up as well. Like holding on to that, it's probably a, a fairly important thing to do because a lot of companies can just poach people with an active clearance mm -hmm. rapidly. So when I read this question, I thought, well, I think the biggest challenge for maintainers are those maintainers that say to me, I don't ever want to touch an aircraft again unless it's flying me to Hawaii. Yep. Right. So I think the biggest challenge for maintainers is when you don't want to do aircraft maintenance anymore. And I don't want you to feel like, well, that's all I know. Yeah. So I have to stay in it. Right. So. Um, I think if people went back and listened to your episode with me, like we would, could talk about like all the skills that yeah. you had from aircraft maintenance that transferred to what you're headed into today, right? So, um, I think the biggest challenge is if you never, no longer want to do aviation maintenance, but your resume is all about aircraft. Let's just say that you want to go, um, I don't know, work for Amazon and manage their equipment within the building and be a production manager for Amazon. Yep. Um, that's great. You're, you have project management, logistics, leadership, human resources, all those skills transfer. But if you talk about them in terms of aircraft, someone's going to look at your resume and go, Oh, why is he applying here? He wants to yep. be in aviation. Yep. So instead of talking about an F 16, you talk about that you maintained a critical piece of equipment that was valued at $27 million, yep. right? So you've got to figure out how to talk about those skills in a new way. Yes, you have transferable skills and you are not stuck in aviation maintenance just because that's what you've done your entire career. There are so many opportunities for you, but you're not going to achieve them unless you translate what you do into the language of that new industry and i'll say that's where your skill set the ones you may not think about that's where it's time to shine like troubleshooting theory is nearly universal i can troubleshoot a dishwasher a microwave a car an aircraft um anything because it's like let me eliminate variables what could possibly be influencing this let me start cutting away what it could be let me isolate let me see this let me see that like you can apply that to so many different things in industry. And then the the kind of the the uh, second piece of that is, uh, I don't think people really understand how much process improvement they uh, cooked into their military career because process improvement, you can see like, this is really inefficient how we're doing this. I mean, we, I mean, that's one of the perks, I use perks uh, loosely and maybe sarcastically of being, in dire resource restrictions, especially in aircraft maintenance for so long, we all are really good at being efficient. Like while I'm going down to fuel barn, I'm going to drop these people off at this place and I can consolidate those trips. And let me have these people. I can only have two people on this checks are both really good. And I can free up my people to do four people on this refuel. Like that's all process improvement. And that's, that's not F-16 specific or aircraft specific. It's let's get the tool room so we can check things out quickly. Let's minimize time and waste and all those things. So that's where those two things, especially in aircraft maintenance, can go so many places out in the world is troubleshooting theory and process improvement, which is, I'd say, 80% of aircraft maintenance is probably those two things. Yeah. And so you have to think about where you want to go. Like, go back to my focus answer, right? Is if you know, I don't want to do aviation maintenance. It doesn't matter if you get your AMP. That's yep. not going to help you. Yep. Your FAA, your FCC radio operator's license, not going to help you, right? So, but maybe a PMP could help you yep. if you want to do project management. Maybe if you want to do human resources, a PA certification for you. Maybe you want to do um, process improvement, a Lean Six Sigma green belt, black belt, whatever your level you're at 
can help you. So you've got to research your industry as part of your focus so you know what certifications you should pursue. Don't just go out and like gather up all these certifications. If you have all of those, someone's going to go, well, what what do you want to do? I've, you know, so I don't, you don't want to put all that on your resume because you don't want to make them sort through a bunch of irrelevant information to find the good stuff. Right. So if, you know, so focus your efforts way back, you know, two years before you want to get out so that you do set yourself up for success all the way through that process. How resistant, at least for maintainers that you've interacted with, maybe enlisted generally, how resistant are they to higher ed, like legit, I shouldn't say legitimate, but more traditional higher education? Because I think a lot of them are looking for AMP, PMP, these sort of certifications. But in my experience, I think a lot of them are not comfortable going to a classroom to get a a full on degree. You know, I, um, I think there are many service members that come out not having pursued education at all, um, Mm -hmm. whether it was they just didn't make the time for themselves to do that or they didn't feel comfortable with it. Um, And they're kicking themselves, right? They're like, oh, I should have, I should have finished my education, but I just didn't take the time. So if you're listening to this and you're five years out, make the time. Yeah. Like take it one class at a time, but make the time because that degree, whether, no matter what it's in, is just, it shows an employer like, oh, you completed a four year degree. It gives you that extra level of legitimacy. But if you're sitting in that position where you finish it, I don't want you to say, well, it's, up, it's over for me, right? So yeah. I will tell you that um, education, I'm sorry, experience is much more valued than education. Yep. So um, don't avoid applying to jobs that say a bachelor's degree is required. Um, because if you showcase your value and you do a really good job of saying, you know, if you hire me, here is the value I will bring you, they'll overlook that education requirement. Um, but even if it's in progress, list that degree, or maybe you have like courses towards your degree, um, list it on there so that it'll kind of ring the bell of the applicant tracking system and it will um, get you through that scan. Yeah. So. So the next question is kind of similar. It's, does your leadership experience help nail down some positions regardless, regardless of degree? And you kind of just said education is good, but experience is huge, but there very well could be a hard education gate that's required to get a job. But also if it says, to, you know, bachelor's degree required, don't let that stop you from applying because they might be able to translate your experience into a degree equivalent. Absolutely. Um, so I guess, um, what's, uh, what are your, what are your thoughts on SkillBridge? Cause that's like the next question that comes up. So I think that SkillBridge is a great program. I think that it is not the answer for everyone, right? I talk to people that have bad skill bridge experiences, just like people have bad employment experiences. So take advantage of it because it gets you, uh, you get to go out and work in the private sector. You get to test the waters in a company, just like they're testing the waters with you. You get to put civilian experience on your resume. Um, I don't want you to think of that like, well, I'm doing skill bridge. So now I got a lock on a job. Yeah. That, that's not necessarily the case. So continue your efforts of job searching and networking, even when you're in skill bridge. But if you have the opportunity to take advantage of a skill bridge program, do it because I know lots of people that it translates into a job for. So yeah. I, you're going to have to take the initiative. It seems like it's a, it's a, it's a win-win situation. Either you figure out it's a great job and you get an offer or you figure out it's not the job for you, which is still information. And it's, yep. it's cutting your, your enlistment or your service short. It's a, it's a little bit of an early out to, which I think is really generous. And I, I, I really can't believe the DOD did it and I'm super happy about it. I just yeah. never thought it would, anything like that would happen. Um, <laughs> I agree. Here's a question. Uh, what tends to be bad advice given to transitioning service members, stuff that probably gets too much attention? Okay. I have a lot on this one. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. The first one is go get a free resume. That's going to be enough for you. Right. And there are, there are lots of great services out there that provide free resumes, but no, they're free mass produced resumes. So I can look at your resume and say, I know exactly who did this for you. That's interesting. Because it reads the same. It's a cookie cutter, copy paste, 
take, let me take this job and plug you in there. I once got one that had the wrong LinkedIn URL on it. Mm. It was, it was a previous just a, person. Yeah, 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 it was copy paste, right? So they, um, they're likely not professional resume writers. They may likely not understand how to translate and focus you in that direction based uh -huh. on kind of who they bring into those roles. And so great service, take advantage of it, but think of that as your foundation. So now we've got, you know, the, one of the things about writing a resume is like, you just got to get something on the paper mm -hmm. and then it starts flowing. Right? So now you've got something on paper, take it and make it your own, put your voice into it, put your accomplishments into it. Most of them that I see are very generic and I want you to put some measurable accomplishments in there. I want you to put your personality and communication style in there. And for heaven's sakes, change the format because they all look alike. Yeah. Right. And so again, that's, that's one of the things I'll tell you is I'm not telling you, Oh, you, everybody needs to go pay for a resume. That is not what I'm saying at all. What I'm telling you is if you just think that that free resume is enough, you're, it's going to be a challenge for you. Mm. So take it and then make it your. Yeah, it makes sense. So think of it as a starting point, right? The other thing, I, I just did a club last weekend on resumes. And um, someone's like, I think I'm going to do a, a functional resume. And so let's talk. I really want to talk about that really quick. Because combination or functional resumes are not going to get you results out there. Really, you need to use a chronological resume. Mm. I have lots of thoughts on how it should be. And, and if you go to my profile, I've written an article on veteran resumes that you might find helpful. But um, a combination resume is where you highlight your skills at the top and then you list your chronology at the bottom. A mm -hmm. functional resume is where it's just skills and there's no dates or chronology. We teach people coming out of prison to write functional resumes. Mm. And while you might feel like you're coming out of prison after the military, <laughs> you're not. And we don't want to communicate that to an employer. So why send that message if that's not really the case? So you always have to have dates on your resume. And so a combination and functional resume that highlights all your skills at the top. An applicant tracking software system doesn't know what to do with yeah. those bullets. And they go nowhere. Mm. So you're your work experience goes in, but there's no bullet points in there for them to pull those keywords from. And you're not going to make it through the screen. That's the bottom line is a combination resume um, or a functional resume. They don't work they don't do well with ATS. So don't do it. And don't let anybody tell you that that's the best way. Even if you're changing career fields from maintenance to being a lawyer, I could still write a resume for Chris. Yeah, my resume just highlights my time as an instructor. So public speaking stuff highlights my time leading people, dealing with discipline and stuff like that. So I can show some leadership stuff. And then, of course, my internship, which is all law related. Yeah. But yeah, I don't. Yeah, I didn't do. I, also do, I don't want you to buy into the narrative that you're going to have to start over. Right. People are oh, you're going to take a step back. You're going to have to start over. And you know what? <laughs> if you're going into a completely new career field, yeah, you might have to start over. You had to take a step back and go to law school to be yep. a lawyer. Um, you're not going to walk in as the managing partner of a law firm, even though you were a manager in the Air Force. Yes, you're, you're changing career fields. You're going to have to start over. Yep. Um, but if let's just say you're going from being a uh, lead pro super and now you want to go be a production manager at a pretzel manufacturing yep. facility you're not going to have to go start on the line manufacturing yep. pretzels you can go as a production supervisor manager in that facility your skills translate you can stay at that same level yep. people often like to in, in tap they tell you in tap you're gonna have to start over you're gonna have to take a step back not necessarily. It depends on where you want to go and what you want to do with your skills. I would say on the flip side, I don't also don't want you to buy into the narrative that, oh, you're going to get a job just because you're a veteran. Everybody's going to be clamoring for you because you're a veteran. That's not the way it works. Right. Yeah. I had <laughs> my post-military job. I applied at a manufacturing company outside Boston as a line worker. And they looked at my resume like, 
you seems like you'd be better suited for a production supervisor. Would you rather just do that? I'm like, yes, I would. I just didn't think because I was <laughs> subscribed to the idea that I had to start at the absolute bottom. They're like a lot of your maintenance experiences from like 10 years ago, but you have a lot of leadership experience in the last 10 years. You'd probably be a bit better production supervisor. So thank you to that hiring manager for being smart enough to recognize my skill set. And yeah, that feels like that feels like a mistake in hindsight that I was aiming too low. Because I was also really cognizant that I didn't feel entitled to some grandiose leadership position because of my military service as well. Well, I know you have to get out of here, Lori, because you have a, a podcast coming up. Um, is there any final thoughts or any final takeaways you want to leave with the listeners before we go? So we touched on it earlier, but I just want you to remember this is your transition. This is you, you're going to do it differently than everybody else. It's but it's your career and it's your life. And so no one is going to do this for you, right? So, um, and as I said, on the flip side, the military will carry on without you. They will be fine. It may never be the same without you, but they will carry on. The mission will get completed. Yep. And so you have dedicated your life and your career to the military, whether it was four years or 24 years, it is now time for you. Yep. It is now time for you to focus on you and to really say, like, what is going to make me happy and own that and figure out how to get there. Yep. I think that's good advice. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Lori. Um, I hope your first time on the other side of the mic was easier than you thought it would be. Um, it was. I appreciate um, all your work you've done for veterans. I appreciate the podcast and how you're trying to make it easier for them. Um, and I always try to share it as much as possible. Uh, I strongly recommend anybody listening, uh, hit up myself or Lori on LinkedIn for a connection request too. Like most of us are maintainers. Most of us are military members. So um, let's take care of each other and set ourselves up for um, you guys' transition in the future. I was gonna say, if you like the podcast, share it. Because that's yeah. my biggest thing right now is not enough people know that it even exists as a resource so please share the podcast tell people about it i just want it to be out there as a resource to help you through that process yeah same goes for this one but luckily i got rabid people that do share so i appreciate it thank you <laughs> uh other than that uh i'm really glad you took some time out of your day today Lori. i appreciate like i said uh you and everything that you do and um i guess that's it all right thanks for having me adios